Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Laura Donardis on the future of the internet. Hello and welcome to Season 5 of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Senior Fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome every week uh, along with my co-host Andrew Thompson, a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation to talk about some important timely topic on the global agenda. And today I'm very happy to welcome Laura Donardis, who's uh, a senior fellow here at CG, as well as a professor of internet architecture and governance at the American University School of Communication. So welcome Thank to you. CG. Very nice to be here. So we're, we're taking advantage of your visit to not only are you speaking with me today, but uh, you'll also be delivering a, a signature lecture series and mm -hmm. that will also be available online. And that's on your recent book. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the book and then we won't duplicate that conversation since our viewers and listeners can, uh, can get that on the other, the other uh, outlet but then we'll try to uh, say additional things about it. Absolutely. I wrote a new book. It's called The Global War for Internet Governance. It came out this year with Yale University Press. And what I tried to do in that book is to explain how the internet is already governed, not just through governments, but through the design of technologies and through the actions of private companies. And then I also raised some of the open global issues in internet governance that will determine the future of our freedom. Great, and war is a big word. <laughs> That's a loaded <laughs> word. So it really is something that is um, high stakes? Uh, it is high stakes. Uh, so war is an intentionally uh, exaggerated word because uh, you know missiles are not being fired. Right. But there are a lot of, um, I, I really do believe that the spaces where there are conflicts over internet governance are the new spaces where economic and political power are unfolding. There are a lot of stakeholders, there's a lot at stake, and it's deter determining the future of things like innovation policy, civil liberties like privacy and freedom of expression and also our security. All right. So what are the forks in the road we face at the moment? What, what are the big directions we could see internet governance and, and the architecture of the internet go in? Certainly. When we get on our iPads or our mobile phones and we access information, it's very easy to forget that there's an entire infrastructure of things behind that that can't be seen. And right now there are a lot of decisions about how those infrastructures are run, and some of those represent the forks. One of the most recent and controversial issues is that a function that has been handled by the U.S. government because of the history of the internet um, emerging in the U.S. primarily, the uh, Commerce Department has been running something called the Critical Internet Resources, and in particular has had a contract with an organization called ICANN, which runs a lot of the systems of internet governance. They just announced that they would transition that to an international multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, it's to be determined what that will be, but that's one of the forks in the road right there. Mm -hmm. and what kind of organization is ICANN? What's its status? This is uh, something that's really interesting about internet governance. We have new global institutions that we've really never had before that transcend national boundaries and make decisions that affect all economies and all nations. So they're actually, though, a nonprofit corporation incorporated in the state of California in the U.S and they have involvement of the private sector, they have some civil society involvement, they have something called a governmental advisory committee that makes decisions, but what do they do is really a, an important question. They manage the unique names like CNN.com and the numbers that computers read, which are binary numbers, that keep the internet operational. Each one of those has to be globally unique and they run a lot of functions around keeping that operational. And do they consult globally when they make these decisions, or is this basically an in-house operation in California? They are uh, located around the world now they, in multiple places, and they do have a lot of glo global consultation. It's a very technical issue, but it's an important issue because they're making decisions that affect free speech. For example, someone just proposed adding a new domain, a new, it's called a top level domain like .com, .edu, .org, et cetera, .uk, adding .wine. And the French government uh, protested. There was a big controversy over who should control dot wine. There was also uh, some concern. Someone proposed dot gay. And the Saudi Arabian government said, well, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't have a dot gay. And then there was dot Amazon proposed by the company Amazon. 
and the com the countries with the Amazonian rainforest within their borders said slow down, maybe it should be controlled elsewhere. So there's a, a lot of power struggles between economic interests, cultural interests, and these traditional territorial governments. And between sort of states wanting to control things and non-state actors wanting to control things. That's right. Very good. We'll be back in a moment with Laura Denardis. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So those of us who follow this in, through the newspapers as opposed to professionally the way you do, uh, we read a lot about things like net neutrality, about um, cyber libertarianism or grassroots control of the internet versus states uh, wanting to exert greater controls and be in a better position to monitor or restrict what actually happens on the internet. Is, is that the main cleavage ideologically, sort of the, the bottom up um, I guess more libertarian oriented and the top down status. Is that the, the driving battle line here in this war for the future of internet governance? Well, there are two camps uh, d or two ways to understand you know, the bipolar positions about internet governance. One is the view that the internet shouldn't be controlled or isn't controlled. And th this is called the cyber libertarian right. view. And on the other side, there is the authoritarian view that governments should step in as governments and to protect citizens, control information. And of course, the reality on the ground is somewhere in between. And the internet is controlled by a combination of different players. Governments are just one example of that. But this notion of grassroots development is something that has historically been in place with the internet for years. And you know, it started in a research community funded by the Department of Defense in the mm. US. But as it developed, these new institutions emerged, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, which does something that a lot of institutions don't do. They let anyone become involved in setting standards for the internet. People participate as individuals, and they can, a lot of them work for companies, of course, but just having that open and participatory nature is usually attributable to this grassroots philosophy. So presumably that's, uh, that's very innovative. That's where you see the rapid progress in the development of internet technologies and internet If we didn't have this participatory environment and a climate of openness, and by openness I mean when they develop the standards, anyone can access them and then develop technologies that compete. If we didn't have that, it would be, we wouldn't have the internet that we have now. Mm -hmm. We went from an environment where we had proprietary technologies where if you were on one online system, you know, in the US we had America Online, Prod Prodigy, and CompuServe. And if you were on CompuServe and I was on America Online, we couldn't communicate with each other. So having this, the open standards that enable the interoperability between different systems is incredibly innovative. A lot of people are worried that now governments are recognizing these structures of internet governance as being points of control, mm -hmm. whether for censorship, whether for enforce, enforcing other kinds of rights like intellectual property rights or increasingly for surveillance as we've seen over the last year that this is something that will compromise that core character of the internet but isn't not true that governments do in fact exert a lot of control over internet activity around the world and yes so even under the existing arrangement which we've had for quite a long time they're still able to do quite a lot i, I guess they just think it's not enough by way of control. Is that Governments it? are a stakeholder yeah. and they have a lot of authority over the internet. For example, a lot of countries have privacy laws. They, they have things like computer fraud and abuse. Let's say that you have an identity theft problem. You want the government to be able to step in and help you. There are all kinds of regulations about uh, hate speech in parts of the world. And uh, you know, some, in some ways though, governments don't have a really good track record with the internet. Just look at the um, Egyptian internet outage where they cut off access. We have massive systems of filtering and censorship in China. We had the disclosures about NSA surveillance in the US. There are a lot of, thing, a lot of ways that governments get involved that are of concern to the internet community. Mm -hmm. And presumably they were involved, we just didn't know so much about it before, for example, Edward Snowden and, and some of the more recent attention on, on espionage and so forth. Right. Many people knew that surveillance was going on and it's absolutely not just the US government. Um, 
almost every government enacts surveillance. I think it was the scale of the disclosures that really drew attention to this issue. Mm -hmm. So where do you see this going? If you had to predict looking at the full range of stakeholders and their interests 20 or 30 years from now, what do you think the internet would look like from a governance perspective? Well, in order to answer that question, you have to try to speculate about what the internet will be and right. what that will look like. And I think one thing we know from history is that we can't even imagine where this could go. We do know that growth will continue if we have three billion people on the internet now that will grow quickly to five billion. Most of the growth will be in emerging markets. So I think that will affect the character of the internet. Mm -hmm. Another major trend is that we're moving into what's called the internet of things. And that means that the internet is moving from a communication system where we think about it as a public sphere to a control system where it's connecting our alarms at home, appliances, fabric, watches and new devices. Right sneakers and cars increasingly and drones so it's connecting now more things than people and this will exponentially increase in the future and i think that that will bring about a certain form of governance and create more concerns for privacy the internet will continue to work and you know we'll still there'll always be a, a back and forth between cybersecurity problems that emerge and then having technological solutions to overcome that but I think at the end of the day, especially in the US, people will still be watching their favorite shows. I live in Washington, DC. Everyone is watching House of Cards on all of their devices right now, and we'll still be able to do that. Right, but if there's an internet of things, if that becomes more and more important, presumably that introduces vulnerabilities and fragilities and risks of common mode failures that could cascade. I imagine that would require um, quite a lot of government-backed uh, regulation, protection, monitoring systems of control just to prevent failures, large-scale failures that would be economically disastrous. I think the greatest risk is the risk of fragmentation around that environment. We're already seeing concerns about moving from a universal internet to a fragmented and nation-specific internet. I really hope that that doesn't happen, but we're already seeing movements in that direction. So I would say the worst case scenario would be where government and intervention and also technological developments make it such that we do have those kinds of fragmentation environments. I just want to give you one example. After the Snowden disclosures, a lot of governments propose doing things such as localizing data within their countries or routing around the United States or having region-specific cloud computing. Now these are things that are politically motivated design choices. So rather than designing things based on engineering efficiency, it's designing it based on those political motives and that, that could actually fragment the internet in unexpected ways. Mm. Fascinating. We'll be back one more time with Laura Donardis. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So among your many hats uh, is that you are serving on the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is a project sponsored by CG and Chatham House. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit about that uh, commission and its mandate and timetable and what you hope to see at the end of it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part not only of, of CG as a senior fellow, but also part of this initiative that CG founded with Chatham House and it's called the Global Commission on Internet Governance and it is a long-term initiative to look at the future of internet governance and to create a strategic vision for that that would promote democratic values. It was announced at the World Economic Forum earlier in the year. Um, it, it's been planned for quite a while. It involves some of the greatest thinkers in internet governance from around the world. It's being chaired by Carl Bildt of Sweden and I'm, the hat that I wear is to direct the research arm of it. Because in addition to trying to develop policy recommendations for internet governance, it also is commissioning research that is empirical in nature that helps us to better understand how internet governance works right now and what the implications could be of various changes. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed the word democratic <laughs> in there, which I think would be a bit of a red flag uh, for certainly some countries around the world. 
Uh, how do you anticipate dealing with the nature of that mandate to, pr to promote a democratic internet if there are some fairly powerful stakeholders out there who might be riled at that? Our economies are completely dependent upon the internet. So no matter what country someone lives in, having a f an open internet where the flow of information continues is completely necessary for us to have a global economy. So I think most cultures believe that keeping internet governance systems running and the flow of information running is in the best interest for all. For all. You know, just from my standpoint, you know, speaking as a scholar, speaking as an American, and speaking as someone who is deeply concerned about the future of internet governance, I have no problem saying that I have a, a democratic vision for the internet, and I think it doesn't have to be the way it is right now. The reason it is the way it is is because of the values that entered into the design. And it's important not to take that for granted. Just because it works now doesn't mean that it will work into the future. So maintaining those kinds of principles of openness and uh, economic openness and economic liberty, as well as issues like free speech, is absolutely imperative for the future of the internet. Mm -hmm. So the commission is expected to generate a report with recommendations after a certain period of time? It's a long-term initiative. It will go on for two years. Uh, we're already commissioning quite a bit of research, and I'm very optimistic about the outcome of that. We've had um, the commissioners have met in Sweden. They're going to be meeting in Korea shortly and in Ottawa shortly after that. And uh, they're, they're going to generate a report with some specific policy recommendations for the future of Internet governance. And these recommendations will be presented to governments, I assume. It's, it really will be written to a general audience, so we don't want to get too uh, technically arcane, but things that are accessible to policymakers and really the high politics of internet governance. Mm -hmm. Now, have you encountered any pushback or are there any alternative efforts to do some parallel things on a different track? There are many discussions about internet governance and I think that that's appropriate. There, are, there has been an ongoing um, global discussion called the Internet Governance Forum, which brings people together every year to discuss issues that are important for um, the control of the internet and freedoms on the internet. I just returned from Istanbul, where the ninth Internet Governance Forum was held, and we were able to bring the commission together for an informal meeting among those who were there. But there's that dialogue that's going on, and there are some efforts that have been formed within ICANN, that institution that I mentioned earlier. Right. So there are many discussions about internet governance, and I think that's appropriate because it's such an important issue. Great. Any big surprises yet, or is it too early? Too early to tell, but I'd say that it's going very well. Great. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming in and helping us understand your project better and understanding the issues better. And uh, thanks to the audience for uh, joining us today. Uh, thanks to the internet. And we look forward to seeing you again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.